Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, The Whip. Michael Wilton, guitarist of Queensryche, or one of the guitarists for Queensryche, who's been with the band, I guess, co-founder, correct? That's right. 42 years, maybe? 40, 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I wanted to take this opportunity, since you are touring the EP, since you're touring The Warning, just to, we did a couple of shows about the EP and The Warning, but I want to hear it from you. You were the guy who were there, that was there. Um, let's just talk about the EP. How did the songs, like when you think about Queen of the Reich, and I think you told me that you, Jeff, and uh, Dick Arma were living together. Is that where the, the inception of these songs started from? I think, you know, this is back when I was uh, 19 years old, and, um, you know, we, ha we had been as the mob, and playing, you know, metal songs at, at places and, and, you know, playing like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Deep Purple, Accept, Tigers of Pantang, whatever, you know. We were into that because at that time, you know, the radio was just playing, you know, pop stuff. And we were young and we wanted to hear metal, you know, so. Um, and. We got to the point where we said, well, let's try, you know, making our own music. And uh, so we, we just started, you know, jamming together and, and got a tape recorder and just started, you know, recording ideas and putting things together. And we had, you know, the, the uh, four songs that were on it, as well as other songs that didn't make it. And... Uh, you know, it was uh, just trial and error. We, we had uh, uh, a different vocalist before Jeff that was in the band and, and it, it, he didn't work out. He went to college or something. You know, so, so there was a vocalist. Like, like, you know, all I kept reading about, like, maybe it was Wikipedia or not, that we had no vocalist. We just were writing songs and... Um, yeah, and then as, as we... Uh, we were doing Battle of the Bands, and, and uh, Jeff was in this, you know, progressive, uh, heavy band, and um, you know, we had these ideas, and, and um, we decided, you know, we'd like to record them at a proper studio, and we, uh, you know, talked to Jeff about it, and started spinning the ideas and everything, and. and uh, um, Chris came up with most of the lyrics, and Jeff came up with, uh, you know, the lady wore black, so. And uh, we, we went to Triad Studios in Redmond, Washington, and um, it was, we were doing the graveyard shift yeah. because we. All bands, yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, we weren't rich or anything, so. Who, who flipped uh, the bill? Well, strangely enough, before all this, I, I worked at a uh, place called Advanced Products, which mm -hmm. um, we tested those transformers when you go overseas when you want to run your hair dryer in 240 <laughs> or 120. So we'd, we'd put these devices on this big multimeter and, and turn voltage through it to see okay. if the, it blew up, right? <laughs> um, but I through that job I was able to hire the other guys everybody but Chris wow. so and that was our income which wasn't great but um, but anyway you know that's that's how it all kinda got into the uh, uh, triad studios was you know the funds from that it that blows, jo day job <laughs> it blows my mind how I, I guess because you're typically like more of a quiet guy right when, in, when, when Queen's Rate was sort of making some strides, it was always Jeff and DeGarmo, and every time people just see them two, they always naturally assume they've done everything. But in fact, you know, I did the math, <laughs> and, and every album, there's a large percentage of, you know, co-writing that you did either by yourself or you were a co-writer in the band. Do you ever feel like, you know what, I'm not getting my due respect, or? Oh, I mean, you know, it, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like the the, the true Queensrÿche fans know the songs and and you know and look at the the writing credits and you know they know the the reality of it. Okay. So, but you know, it's just as we've evolved over the decades and you know we're into this version of Queensrÿche and every you know we're doing all these old songs which 
you know, a lot of them are, are my riffs from when I was 19, 20 years Crazy. old. <laughs> Crazy. So um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really amazing to see people coming out of the woodwork to hear this live show that we're doing, this Origins tour. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, for me to, to go back and, and wow. listen to what I wrote, you know, when I was 20 years old, it's like, I don't think that way anymore. So I had to get back into that and uh, go on YouTube and see some old... Uh, see other guys doing your stuff to so, learn what you're doing. Well, there's like, there, I, I think there's a YouTube of uh, Harpo's or something yeah, yeah. where we were playing some of these songs. <laughs> and I'm trying to listen because it was done with cassette recorders or, yeah, you know, yeah. so the audio wasn't good. But I... You know, I'd, I'd search, i go, how did, you know, just to see where my hand position was on the guitar neck. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy. Um, and, and then, okay, for the success of the EP, nobody expected. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, we, we uh, recorded uh, a demo cassette. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were really proud of it. <laughs> it was like, we, this is cool. And uh, so we took it to the... Uh, record store. You know what? Hold on. Come here, Ted. Come in the shot. Yes. This and this we should talk about just this logo. Who came up with this? Uh, if you could see him, I don't know if you can get know, in, the shot, in the but, shot. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was uh, a combination been, of, of one guy you'll see on the back of the the album and Scott's brother, uh, okay. Todd Rockenfield. So. Oh, okay. Because that, that, even though it, it says 80s, but it also says like legacy. It, it's just that image, that, that sort of EP, sort of purple and yellow is... Yeah, I know. It, it, it's, it's, it's very 80s, but at the same time, it's legendary in a sense. Yeah, and it's, you know, we've just grown with it. We thought it was royal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, but, uh, uh, but it's like, it's, it's the Minnesota Vikings color. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so so anyway, we yeah. would we would go to Easy Street Records. Kim and yeah. Diana Harris uh, owned this record store, and we'd buy all the imports, you know, that we were listening mm -hmm. to in the formulative years, and um, we gave them the demo cassette, and they were playing it in the store through the speakers, and there were kids in the store, and they were going, "Who's this? Wow, who's this?" You know, and it's like. We're saying that's us, you know, and they go, no, this sounds like it's from London or, or uh, Germany or something, you know, and and, and uh, but the uh, the record store owners believed it, and you know, through meetings and coming to a conclusion of let's press it if we can, and they uh, they funded, you know, to get the the cassette demo of the EP. Uh, pressed and I think we did you know batches up to like 50 or 60 thousand and Un unbelievable for an EP right that yeah was. back back in that day and um, uh, and uh, Kerrang magazine in, in London yeah you know got a hold of one of the demos or something and, and did a, a, a story on us called armed and ready mm -hmm. for and had our picture on there and it was then it just kind of blew up and um, I mean I, I'm in that picture and I'm wearing a Bruce Lee <laughs> kung fu outfit you gotta wear kung fu. <laughs> love Bruce Lee. and it's like I can not believe they used that picture but anyway that was uh, you know what got it started and uh, with you know our new original music we hadn't played live you know we did a few shows with zebra yeah and uh you know and then all of a sudden you know we sister then that was like uh, what was uh showcase maybe? we did uh the paramounts in seattle and portland and then i think we went to texas and did the texas jam with quiet riot oh there you go yeah <laughs> you know and we did uh uh some club in la um but then, you know, the, then the rec record company came knocking on the door and we were like... Okay, here, this is what we were talking about. I was talking with Sean Drover this. I go, they got signed to a six album contract deal. Mm -hmm. And then, this is correct, right? It was six or seven yeah, albums, yeah. including the EP, right? It was the EP re-released. Mm -hmm. 
and then six other albums to follow. Yeah. So, is that unheard of back then or even today? It was mind blowing. It was, yeah. you know, I, I, we just went with it. <laughs> it's like. Um, did, did, did you get your parents involved, lawyers, and everybody sitting around a table? What is these people? Yeah, well, mean? yeah, we had to get, you know, all the paperwork in order and sign the documents and. and was 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 that a fair contract? Like, I'm not going to get into the ins and outs, but do you, looking back, you say this was a, a fair contract for the time, for given that everybody else wasn't getting these types of contracts. Yeah, and it was, you know, it's like we we got a budget to to go to London and and record the next album. Yeah. So, um, of course, back then we didn't know that we had to pay all that back. Yeah, well, yeah, no one's going to tell you that. <laughs> No one's going to tell you that. Right? Yeah. But still, six, seven albums, that, that's pretty big, right? And yeah. It's, it's a commitment, right? Yeah. And, you know, recording The Warning, I mean, we, use, we recorded with James Guthrie, who had just done The Wall. Yeah. Very creative, uh, just an amazing guy, you know? And, and uh, we were living in, in flats in East London. Mm -hmm. I remember it was uh, Notting Hill Gate. Oh. And, you know, we didn't know anything about England and riding the tube and, and, and you know, doing, doing all the things that they do over there. But we, we adapted and we had a lot of fun. And we recorded it at various studios, you know, some studios for the drums, like more of a church. And then uh, other studios that were better suited for the guitars. And, and uh, you know, then then we uh, got a hold of uh, Michael Kamen through James Guthrie. And we recorded uh, orchestration at Abbey Road. So I mean, it was amazing times. You know, we we'd uh, rehearse in the rehearsal studios, and I remember uh, Boy George. I met Boy George. He was he was rehearsing in there. <laughs> People were peeking their heads in, you know, <laughs> going, who's this band, you know? It's like... <laughs> uh, I mean, there you are, you're recording the album, you're he hearing the album. Would you believe that today you would be actually performing the album, like on a tour, that same album, 40-something years ago? You know, it's... It's, it's just mind-blowing that you could get five guys with different backgrounds and influences and, and uh, different, you know, personalities that, that worked. Yeah. You know, most bands, there's always, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. And, but everything just worked. And we just created this music that was the five of us. That it, it wasn't patterned after a band or anything like that. It was just what we thought would be cool music. Uh, let, me, let me ask you, let's, let's, let's talk about some songs here. NM156, I've already asked you this question. All right, can you, what, is this, what does this stand for? What are these numeric, alph it's alphabetic? It's like non-man 156, no man. 156. Yeah. All right, Take Hold of the Flame. What do you remember from recording that song? Uh, that's a song that, that Chris came up with, um, and it was, uh, very melodic. I remember it was it was more kind of uh, straightforward, so it was kind of a rocker. Um, yeah, and today, you know, still when we play it, it's like an anthem now. Yeah, yeah. Roads to Madness. This is one of yours, right? Yeah, I I came up with uh, the music that is up until the uh, fast part, and then Chris came up with the the second half. Yeah. And um, yeah, just what, what ingredients from your influences went into that song? Uh, you know, back then we were listening to a lot of uh, you know Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Deep Purple, Rush, um, Pink Floyd. You know, so it's I think you know it all just kind of fell into place, yeah. and you know, and force. And that, that's a, a killer rocker that, that Chris came up with. Um, 
and you know back then it was like you wanted things to be thematic you know and and grandiose and and so it, it uh i remember the uh, we put the acoustic yes. ending yes. on it which is was that like a mistake or was that was just no. put a little fade and then we'll come back to the song again no it was it was definitely the part that yeah. was was built for that so yeah. um yeah. a deliverance another one of yours right yeah, I wrote that one and the lyrics, and, um, you know, that's just a rocker, and then, you know, that is more of my, just the way I write, you know, it's a, sometimes considered progressive, and uh, just to, you know, Chris and I would think not in fours, we would think in threes, and sixes, and sevens, and thirteens, and elevens, you know, just to be different, right? And uh, that song has definitely got some uh, tricky elements to yeah, it. Yeah. L let me ask you this now. Now when you perform the songs on the Origins Tour, it's in standard tuning. tuning. Mm -hmm. There's no fooling around. What does Todd bring to these songs today? Oh, he, Todd LaTorre, that is. He brings life to this. I mean, the, the energy on stage is just mind-blowing. And because uh, this was one of his favorite albums when, yeah, when he was growing up, you know? It's like he, he learned to play drums to this album. And uh, so for him, it's just been a natural. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, over the years, we'd, we'd play certain songs from The Warning, but, but to do it all in the order of the album, you know, you, you realize the, uh, you know, that we spent a lot of time on the sequencing of the uh, order of the songs, as far as the different keys, um, the moods, and it, and it just, it flows, and you can feel that in the performance, you know, it's, it's, it's like, all right, we know what's going to be this song, and this song goes into that one, and this one goes into that one, and, and it just works, it flows am amazing. And, and again, I think for memory, the record company wanted another sequence of songs, oh. or was it the other way around? No, I, I think what happened was that we were getting, I don't know, too progressive or conceptual, I don't know, something that they, they wanted to, to get their hands on it and have their in-house guy mix okay. it. So they, they, they took it away from James. Okay. All right, and the mix, that's the last question. Were you really happy with the mix at the end of the day? I, I know today, People don't mind the mix, but was the band happy with the mix? I think at that time we preferred uh, James Guthrie's mix. Okay. Um, the, which I have a cassette of. Okay. And it's 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 quite different, but uh, um, but you know, as we know today, the the. There you go. It's it stood the test of time, regardless. Yeah, the songs were songs. Yeah. All right, on that note, that's the Origins Tour for Queens, right? Playing the first EP and The Warning in the sequence that the albums actually had them in. Mm -hmm. Michael Wilton, The Wit, uh, thank you for being on. Thank you. All right.